how about an egg hunt underwater? Take a look at this. A diving instructor in Florida held the hunt. Spencer Slate placed hard-boiled eggs among the coral and sea life for participants to find. Slate has been hosting this underwater hunt for 20 years. And Easter Bunny doesn't just come to humans. He brought some goodies to the animal residents at South Australia's Monorato Safari Park. The adorable residents, well, they couldn't wait to break into their baskets to eat their mealworm-filled eggs and kibble-filled bunnies. Yum, yum, yum. Well, head on News Edge at 11. We had a beautiful Sunday of weather. But will it last for the work week? That's the big question. Fox 5 storm team meteorologist Jonathan Sandy wrote around 3 p.m. We also have learned that police that found at least one victim there. A short time later, investigators learned there were two others injured. All three were taken to a hospital. The shooter responsible still on the run tonight. Another shooting, this one in DeKalb County, playing out at two different locations. Police say the victim was shot at a car wash on Memorial Drive. And we're told his friend tried to take him to the hospital, but stopped at the Popeyes once he realized the injuries were most likely fatal. Police arrived and pronounced him dead at a short time later. Police have not named a suspect, but they are looking into what led up to the shooting. A third shooting. Police were police opened fire on a suspect. Why was he shot and not tased? And nobody could give me any kind of answers or anything like that. So they followed me to the GBI department. The father of the man shot by an Atlanta police officer yesterday morning on North Avenue. He spoke with our Kim Loeffler and says his son had to undergo surgery, but he's not out of the woods just yet. He wants to know more about what happened. Theodore Duffy says his son, Demario, underwent a second surgery earlier today here at Grady Memorial Hospital, but still has a long way to go. She had been shot twice, once in the arm and one in the stomach. Theodore Duffy says he found out late Saturday night that his son, Demario Duffy, had been shot by an Atlanta police officer. They was able to take the breathing tool out, and he breathed it on his arm. But they still say he got a long way to recover. According to the GBI, an APD officer responded to a scene along North Avenue where a truck crashed into a guard post around 4 a.m. Saturday morning. They say Jamario was driving that truck. The officer tried to make contact with him through the passenger side window, then went to the driver's side. That's when the officer opened Jamario's door and he tried to drive away. The male driver of that vehicle became immediately irate, exited the vehicle, and began assaulting the police officer. That's when investigators say the officer fired his weapon. Immediately, I just, you know, kind of lost it as a dad, you know, wondering what was going on. Uh, I didn't know why he was there. At this point, there's no indication Demario was armed. His father wants more answers. I didn't mention any weapons or anything like that, so why was he shot and not tased? And nobody could give me any kind of answers or anything like that, so they followed me to the GBI department. We reached out to the GBI today, and they told us there's no updates in this case. The GBI is conducting an independent investigation, and then we'll give their findings over to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. In Atlanta, Kim Lawson, Fox 5 News. Fight in Buckhead. Police were called to Roswell Road around 8 p.m. where they found that man with several cuts on his body. Investigators say he was stabbed during a fight with a woman he knew. Police quickly arrested and charged her, but they have not released the woman's name or what charges she faces. What? And Burton was considered armed and dangerous. The two other suspects, 17-year-old Robert Landrew Robinson and 12-year-old Christopher Dell Atkins, were arrested on Friday, charged with first-degree murder. Police believe these three boys and their three victims to all be affiliated with criminal gangs, and that at some point, something led the suspects to turn on the others. Turning to a shooting now to Delaware Mall at the Christiana Mall near Pennsylvania around 6.45 p.m. Saturday night, following a fight in the food court. Police still aren't sure how many people were involved in the shooting, but investigators are still on the scene today, collecting evidence, examining surveillance video, and speaking with witnesses. Turning to Ukraine with emotional returns as more than 30 Ukrainian children returned home after their alleged legal deportation by Russia. About damn time. Heartwarming video there. Crossing the border on Friday after spending months in Russia and occupied Crimea, According to humanitarian groups, Save Ukraine, they say some of the children were released after their mothers went to Russia to track them down. 
Those women also had the power over the attorney to bring back the rest of the children. Ukraine says so far more than 16,000 children have been illegally deported by Russia, leading to an international arrest warrant out for President Vladimir Putin. But Russia still denies any wrongdoing. From President Biden, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, underline those concerns. Tonight, News Ads reporter Rob Durienzo takes a closer look at the problem, but also possible solutions. Well, the people I'm hearing from say that they've lived where they've lived for a long time, but now these out-of-state developers are coming in and scooping up their property, leaving them with no place to go. I'm still out here trying to find out what can we do. Barbara Daniel has lived in Athens all of her 60 years. She says a development boom fueled by out-of-state investors is pushing elderly and disabled residents out of their homes. They buy a property. That's all they do. They buy a property. And they um, come in and run them out to people that can afford it. As the University of Georgia expands its student population and Athens' real estate market has ballooned, few legal protections exist for people like Barbara. She was forced out of her home after living there for two decades. She's since been staying with a friend. The alternative? On the street. There's a lot of elder people that's on the street. There's a lot of young people families on the street because they have nowhere to go. Last week, President Biden's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, heard from people in Gwinnett County about the housing crisis, pledging more resources like tax credits and grants for the construction of affordable housing. Earlier this year, Georgia state lawmakers introduced a bill aimed at large institutional investors who, just like Barbara describes, snatch up single-family homes, jack up the price, and rent them out. That bill, HB 490, died at the end of the legislative session before it could be brought to a vote. Barbara says time is of the essence. It's not only about me. It's about a lot of people. It's about elder people. It's about the vet people. It's about the homeless people. It's about all of us out here. In Athens, Rob DiRienzo, Fox 5 News. Hasn't been any affordable housing since the Olympics. Party. For example, the largest shareholder of the New York Times is Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim. Slim's investments with communist-controlled companies span automotive and high-tech and make up a large portion of his wealth. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post for $250 million. Along with Amazon products being made in China's state-owned factories, Bezos wants to expand Amazon's business in China, saying that Amazon is well-positioned to serve China. Also, Bezos' connection to the Communist Party is clear in the advertising section of the Washington Post which includes a supplement called China Watch. China Watch is written by China Daily, the main propaganda outlet for the Communist Party. And in the past few years, they've paid American newspapers, including the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, nearly $19 million to run the inserts. But that's not the end of it. A recent report from the Department of Justice's Foreign Agent Registration Act revealed scathing information that a group in the U.S. directly linked to the Chinese Communist Party is arranging private dinners and sponsored trips to China for media outlets and top journalists who are selected for effectiveness. The mission is to garner favorable coverage on China. And in turn, hundreds of positive articles on China have been published. Some of those media outlets include ABC, NBC, Associated Press, Reuters, Bloomberg, CNN, CNNBC, MSNBC, The New York Times, Newsweek, NPR, The Huffington Post, The Atlantic, The Financial Times, USA Today, The Economist, Time Magazine, Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, and the list goes on and on. But what's this have to do with covering up crimes against humanity? Well, for over 20 years, human rights groups like Amnesty International and also the United Nations have reported that Chinese citizens who practice the spiritual discipline of Falun Gong are being demonized, tortured, and killed by their government. In the early 90s, Falun Gong was supported, awarded, and even endorsed by the Communist Party. It taught to live a spiritual life. Practitioners are encouraged to follow traditional values, to tell the truth, to be compassionate and tolerant, to be responsible to their families, and to be hardworking and good people in society. News reports even quoted government officials who stated that Falun Gong dramatically reduced health care costs nationwide. However, at that time, the Communist Party leader was Jiang Zemin. He came to power largely by supporting the 1989 Tiananmen Square student massacre. When he found that Falun Gong was not controlled by the state, he viewed its popularity and promotion of spirituality as a threat to the party's control. He stated, 
How could the Marxism we endorse and the materialism and atheism we believe in not crush what Falun Gong propagates? If it were true, wouldn't we become laughingstocks? The Communist Party must eliminate Falun Gong. And on July 20th, 99, he launched a nationwide violent crackdown. In the beginning, mainstream media reported on the mass injustices, thousands being arrested, people sentenced to 18 years in sham trials, tens of thousands suffering in labor camps, unspeakable cases of sexual torture, psychiatric abuse, young school teachers beaten to death by police, horrific cases of men and women being burned, mutilated, and electrocuted to death. A Wall Street Journal reporter even won a Pulitzer Prize for exposing the mass torture and killings of Falun Gong practitioners, including Miss Chen, a 58-year-old grandmother who police beat to death over three days for simply pleading for her freedom to believe. Under orders from the regime that no measures are too excessive to wipe out Falun Gong, she was whipped and beaten with plastic pipes, punched in the face and head, electrocuted with stun guns on her neck. Her ears were swollen black from torture, and all her teeth were broken. She crawled outside her cell, vomited, and died. The reporter stated, the effects on society of such systematic brutality is hard to gauge. None of the deaths have been reported in the Chinese media. But then, in the 2001 lead-up to the Beijing Olympic bid, reports surfaced on how Jiang Zemin was influencing mainstream media to remain silent to the crimes happening to Falun Gong in China. For example, in 2001, the New York Times publisher flew to China to meet with Jiang Zemin. Days later, NewYorkTimes.com was suddenly unblocked in China. And since then, they've been mostly quiet on the persecution and even published stories attacking Falun Gong. In March 2001, James Murdoch, son of media tycoon Rupert Murdoch, returned from China and stunned attendees at the annual Milken Institute Business Conference by viciously attacking Falun Gong with Communist Party propaganda. In the years that followed, a sample of Associated Press and AFP and Reuters articles showed 75% were spurred by Chinese government sources attacking the group. In 2007, CBC, Canada's national news network, who held the broadcast rights to the 2008 Beijing Olympics, cancelled a scheduled documentary on Falun Gong after pressure from the Chinese embassy. Documentaries on Falun Gong were also quietly killed by PBS, CNN, and 60 Minutes. In 2015, a Beijing-based New York Times reporter found strong evidence backing experts and tribunal conclusions that prisoners of conscience are being slaughtered in mass numbers for their vital organs by the communist state, where Falun Gong practitioners are possibly the main victim. However, New York Times editors told her not to pursue the story. The picture is quite clear that for fear of losing billions of dollars, mainstream media is being censored by the Communist Party when it comes to their crimes against Falun Gong. Recently, some mainstream media with strong ties to the Communist Party have attacked Falun Gong with religious bigotry and hatred, hauntingly similar to Communist Party propaganda that Falun Gong is political and a danger to society. But is trying to stop the torture and killing of human beings actually considered political? I mean, if your loved ones or friends were being murdered, would you not approach your government for help? For over a quarter century, Falun Gong has been practiced right here and in over 100 countries by millions from different races. And for 20 years, against all odds of violent persecution, it's been Falun Gong's peaceful and rational efforts to help save the lives of others that has garnered support from millions who have signed petitions calling for an end to the persecution and also from government officials worldwide, including five unanimously passed bipartisan U.S. Congress resolutions, ten resolutions passed by European Parliament, and thousands of officials who have issued proclamations and signed statements calling for an end to the persecution. Also, the founder of Falun Gong, Mr. Li Hongzhu, is a five-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee. He was nominated by the European Parliament for the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, and he's the recipient of Freedom House's International Religious Freedom Award. These actions should speak volumes about the spirit of Falun Gong's teachings. One of the up and the price of the pumps is at record high. Before I fill up my car, now I have to talk to my financial advisor. National Dump the Pump Day was held this week in an effort to encourage people to leave their cars at home and use public transit. Here's just a little reminder of why people pay through the teeth at the pumps to avoid public transit. Russia's invasion is having an effect on its athletes. As more and more sports organizations ban Russian athletes as punishment for the war, 
Russian athletes are finding it harder and harder to take banned drugs and cheat in their sports. I was just getting used to my newly formed web feet, said one Russian swimmer. A VHS copy of Back to the Future has fetched a whopping $75,000 at an auction. Sounds like a great deal, but the video owed over $72,000 to Blockbuster and late fees. We're receiving reports out of the Ukraine that the situation in Chernobyl is worse than originally reported, thanks to Russia looting and reckless disregard for safety. That doesn't sound like the Russians. Okay, okay, I gotta pump the brakes here. This is weird. I'm reporting on inflation, a Russian invasion, Back to the Future, and Chernobyl? Did I just zip into some bizarre time warp? These are also stories relevant to the 1980s. Look, if we're gonna go back to the 80s, let's just go back to the 80s. Good evening, I'm Bernard Shaw. China's demand for power sets a new record as heat waves strike across the country. If there was only some way we could harvest people's organs for power, we'd have this problem solved, said a CCP spokesman. U.S. cities consider naming heat waves the way hurricanes are named as a warning system. The first three heat waves will be named Mother, Effin, and Hot. If you didn't get that, I said it's Mother, Effin, Hot. I'm Bernard Shaw. I can say whatever the hell I want. The 1980s people wanted to sleep with someone else's wife. The bill was in probably on the 80s. Is Chuck. Hey, Bernard. Hey, Chuck. So, are the 80s going to be able to outdo the 70s? Oh, they sure are. Say goodbye to leaded gas, unnecessary wars, and smoking reefer, and say hello to self-serve gas, the Sandinistas, and so much cocaine, Americans will start eating sushi. Say hello to my little friend. Ooh, it's the 1980s. They're called midgets. And what are the munchkins? I believe they were bought out by the Cabbage Patch Kids. There's going to be a lot going on this decade, so find a way to keep track. Maybe get yourself a Polaroid camera or a fax machine. That sounds like an electronic donkey. Ooh, it's called British New Wave Music, and it's here to stay. Music in the 80s is going to border on, well... And sometimes it's going to be totally tubular. Plus, you can take it with you. Grab your cassette tape, slide it into your Walkman, and turn up the volume to ensure pedestrian fatalities in your town increase dramatically. <laughs> you got me a ghetto blaster. Ooh, does it work? Sure does. As soon as I track down 36 D cell batteries, it does. <laughs> <laughs> it will never get better than this. This just in. It just got better than that. Your cassette tapes are now garbage. Please replace them immediately with compact discs. Why? Oh, slightly improved sound that you will hardly be able to notice. Are they cheaper? To produce? Yes. To buy? No. Expect a lot of that this decade. Improvements that aren't actually improvements at all. Higher. The administration says that they're partnering with GM this month to help end distracted driving. And they say that they're also taking a look at road infrastructure across the country and say that this could help improve those numbers. In the newsroom, Madison Schlegel. Ann Burton was considered armed and dangerous. The two other suspects, 17-year-old Robert Landrew Robinson and 12-year-old Christopher Dell Atkins, were arrested on Friday, charged with first-degree murder. Police believe these three boys and their three victims to all be affiliated with criminal gangs and that at some point, something led the suspects to turn on the others. Turning to a shooting now to Delaware Mall at the Christiana Mall near Pennsylvania around 6.45 p.m. Saturday night following a fight in the food court. Police still aren't sure how many people were involved in the shooting, but investigators are still on the scene today, collecting evidence, examining surveillance video, and speaking with witnesses. Turning to Ukraine with emotional returns as more than 30 Ukrainian children returned home, after their alleged legal deportation by Russia. About damn time. <laughs> Heartwarming video there. Crossing the border on Friday after spending months in Russia and occupied Crimea, according to humanitarian group Save Ukraine. They say some of the children were released after their mothers went to Russia to track them down. Those women also had the power of the attorney to bring back the rest of the children. Ukraine says so far more than 16,000 children have been illegally deported by Russia, leading to an international arrest warrant out for President Vladimir Putin. 
but Russia still denies any wrongdoing. Upon if still recovering from bronchitis, skipping the traditional Good Friday procession at Rome's Colosseum due to an unseasonably, unseasonably cold nighttime temperatures. <laughs> And dozens of Palestinian Christians gathering today in Gaza City for a mass celebrating Palm Sunday. Sunday is Easter in the Western Christian calendar, but it's Palm Sunday for Eastern Orthodox Christians. This year, the holiday coincides with the Jewish holiday of Passover and the Muslim holiday month of Ramadan. However, rising tensions in Jerusalem and a surge in Israeli-Palestinian violence are casting a shadow over this holy week. You're looking at warehouse fires breaking out today in Hamburg, Germany. Police warning people to close their windows due to chemical smoke drifting now through the city. The smoke causing long-distance trains to come to a stop, traveling between cities like Hamburg and Berlin. A public safety alert sending fear through the city, advising people to close their windows, turn off of ventilation and air conditioning, and avoid the area. Public broadcasters there say the fire involves containers with hydrogen sulfide, toxic substance forcing firefighters to wear their masks. So far, no injuries have been reported. Continuing in Germany, the last surviving prosecutor from the Nuremberg trials has died. Benjamin Ferenz made history as the United States and its allies demanded accountability after World War II. World War II. A spokesperson for the U.S. Holocaust Museum says he died Friday. He was 103. He tried 22 Nazis for crimes against humanity and was the first person to use the term genocide in a court of law. Before becoming a lawyer, Ferenz helped to liberate several concentration camps and survived five major battles during the war. Last January, he was awarded the U.S. Congressional Gold Medal but was unable to attend the ceremony due to poor health. Now that you're all caught up on today's top stories, let's take a look back on some of the top headlines from this past week. Here to catch us up is Newsnet's Jace Hamill. Jace? Taking a look back now on some of this week's top headlines, beginning in Manhattan with the arraignment of former...